Okay, uh, hello everyone and welcome for the fourth interview in our ongoing interview series that has been titled as Shades of Green. Uh, last uh, Saturday we had a very interesting, very thought-provoking interview with uh, architect Sanjay Prakash from Delhi and uh, uh, he raised some really interesting points regarding what kind of directions that one can take when it comes to developing theories and understanding related to sustainable development, particularly when it comes to the field of architecture and design. And I'm really glad to share that today also we have another very uh, experienced and very senior architect joining today from Delhi architect Ashok B. Lal. Uh, sir, welcome uh, on Aki Diaries. Hello. Uh, I'm also I'm also really glad to announce that today we have Professor Jigna Desai who has joined uh, today with us as a as a guest panelist. She's an architect and associate professor at uh, Faculty of Architecture, Sept University. Jigna, thank you for joining with us. Thank you very much. So, without much ado, I will first please allow me to introduce our guest, our panelist. Uh, I'll start with Professor Ashok Kalal. Ashok Lal, uh, born 1948, is a practicing architect based in Delhi. His architectural practice is based on the principles of environmental sustainability and social responsibility. Engaged in architectural education since 1990, he has developed curricula and teaching methods to address environmental issues. He has published many articles and presented papers on environmentally sustainable design and has been an active member of institutions and groups promoting awareness and building competence in sustainable design of buildings. He is presently Design and Technology Chair at Kamala Raheja Vidyanidhi Institute of Architecture, Mumbai. His current interest is in developing strategies for sustainable development in the context of rapid urbanization. Please also allow me to introduce Professor Jigna Desai. Uh, Dr. Jigna Desai is an Associate Professor and Program Chair for Masters in Conservation and Regeneration at the Faculty of Architecture, SEPT University, Ahmedabad. She is also Executive Director, Center for Heritage Conservation, SEPT Research and Development Foundation. She has worked extensively on architecture and conservation projects, research and advisory in different parts of India, carried out advocacy for community-based conservation in partnership with national and international institutions and government organizations. Through her engagements with architectural practice with GMA Design Collaboration, an award-winning small practice that she founded with architect Mehul Bhatt, she has also explored various facets of sustainability. The title for today's talk that Professor Ashok Lal has chosen is very uh, stimulating, very thought-provoking. It goes something like this, Sustainable Built Environment and the Developing World. I would like to invite Prutha to share the text that uh, uh, Professor Ashok Lal has shared with us. Sustainable Built Environment and the Developing World. Taking the example of India, the talk tries to identify the reality on the ground of the processes and trends that, determining, that are determining the growth of towns and cities. From this ground of reality, the talk attempts to develop a theory of sustainability as a built environment that might take urbanizing India towards environmental security, social and economic equity with low carbon urban living. The talk cites some of the challenges that such a strategy faces and invites the audience to think about them as a collective of the professions of the built environment. I welcome Ashok sir to share his presentation with us. Well, thank you and good morning to everyone. Uh, I have to share my screen, right? Yes, sir. I click the button and I click it again. And once more. And the final time. <laughs> yeah, I think I've got what I want. Yes, sir. You're there. Right. So here we are, this, this is the title that I put down here, it's just a rewording or you might say a slight extension of what has just been read out to you. It's turning this the title in a way up, 
the other way around saying, what is a developmental approach or practice in the built environment? And looking at our part of the world in India um, as, um, as, the, as a reference, you might say, yeah? So the thing is that um, we are urbanizing quite rapidly. Um, and cities are growing. And we see in the cities um, the idea that, you know, they're supposed to be so-called planned cities and you have the planners trying to shape what the city should be. But what the city turns out to be is something which is really um, attention and a, you might call it a negotiation between the intentions of the grand plans and the way people have to make their own space in the city and live out their lives. So it's a, it's a complex situation. Um, and the question that I'm asking here is, what is the role of the designer, the designer of the built environment in such an evolving complex world? Well, you know, traditionally we architects, when we were brought up, I'm talking about me particularly, I think it's true of many of us in many schools of architecture, we thought of the designer as a creator of exquisite cultural artifacts. And um, this great designer would always seek out the patronage of the rich and the powerful, whether it is Madam Zaha Hadid, who is no longer with us, or it is Roshnara Begum from the days of Shah Jahan, all Mr. Latin's wearing a wig over here, just for a bit of a joke, because I'm referring to the designer in the feminine gender. So this is what we thought um, architects were. And then came the time after the Great World Wars um, and the birth of free nations um, and people now beginning to look at their role in the breadth of society, whether it was Frank Lloyd Wright or Corbusier, or at home, we have Yoshisab, we have Charles and many others who think of, um, they throw themselves into a rapidly changing world of increasing social and environmental stress. And in conceiving and designing for a world uh, with less stress, more harmony, the, develop, the, the designers then become development practitioners. So this is the second title, you might say, uh, the first title of uh, the maker of cultural artifacts. That's architecture with a capital A. Then you have a second title, which is the development practitioner. You see if this moves on. Yeah, let me move it this way. And then as populations in the world grew and technologies developed and international trade started and with the rapidity and scale of the production of built environment, which is causing environmental degradation, the ecological stress, what we are now realizing, and this is what, you know, your series is about, a designer must necessarily become a steward of the environment. And so this in a sense becomes a, uh, a third title for the designer of the built environment. Um, and you could see as the beginning of this picture was showing that there is a direct correlation, absolutely direct correlation between the way we are living in cities, the way we are building our cities, and the havoc it is creating in the, in the globe at, at large, in the natural ecosystems, and causing climate change. And so here we are. And you might say that it is only when in one's practice, one combines these three titles as active titles. 
or this passive one, this active titles, that you become a complete professional. You must be a development practitioner. You must practice your developmental work as an environmental steward. And in doing all of this, you will produce cultural artifacts that will be loved, enjoyed, celebrated, uh, and remembered. And so this, in a way, is, is my kind of definition of a complete contemporary uh, professional. Now, here we are. It's an image of a city. It's kind of familiar to all of us, right? So you have a combination of um, crowded little spaces and something that we see from history the city of the 19th and the early 20th centuries. And then you have so-called modern cities, which are going taller and taller and more and more intensive. And this is something to do, or completely to do, you might say, with this process of urbanization. And it seems to be pretty much inevitable. It is only in the distribution of urbanization, spatial distribution, um, where the differentiation can occur, but generally uh, from an agriculture and rural-based kind of economy where most people were engaged, more and more people are moving into an, a, a different economy of production and services uh, in smaller towns, medium-sized towns, big towns. And this is also, for now, at least for the next 20, 30 years, as far as we can see, is accompanied by a growth in population. And as you urbanize and as the populations continue to grow, all these people, all of us, continually also seek a better quality of life. And you can see that there is a big contrast between the quality of life enjoyed by different groups of people in a city, depending on whether you are rich or whether you're poor, and there's equally a great contrast between the quality of life that is being enjoyed. Now, if you are in a small town or in a distant village as compared to that of the city. And so this is the story of the developing world globally. This is the story uh, which can be generalized as a, as a feature of today's state of the world. Another important feature to realize is that most developing countries, even today, including ours here in India, have people like me, you might say, and many others who are quite well off, and we call ourselves the wealthy gang. We are global citizens. We talk often of what do they call it? World class, you know, that sort of ambition. These are kind of slogans we bandy about. Um, but it's just 5% of us in the city, people like that. And then half of the city, or more than half of the city, are people who came to the city or stuck in the city. And they are the struggling, struggling bottom half of the city. Um, looking for a hold in the urban economy as it grows and looking for building a better life for themselves and their families uh, over there, this one generation or the next sort of two generations. And in between, of course, you have an upwardly mobile middle class. And one of the characteristics of this upwardly mobile middle class is that it is quite fascinated by the lifestyle of the wealthy, global class. And they feel that that is where they need to go. Everybody is looking for that life in the, you know, like that in Europe or America or the well-to-do parts of the world, you want to be there. And that's quite a lot of people are looking for that. So if you were to kind of analyze this in terms of what is happening over the city, you would say that the wealthy group 
has spatial access in the city. You can live wherever you choose to live, at whatever price it might be, more or less. You will enjoy relative environmental security. Bijli Pani will be there. You can make yourselves comfortable in your workspaces, in your homes, more or less. And you actually enjoy a development advantage because you're well connected with the world, you're well educated, and you have, um, you have access even to finance and so on and so forth. So you are a privileged lot. Um, but you are the ones who are consuming natural systems and resources and energy at a rate which is similar to the rate at which it is being consumed in say America or Australia or Singapore for that matter. You know, you, you're really your rates of consumption are extremely high. At the opposite end, you have a different condition. You have a people, a bunch, who don't have spatial access. They suffer from what you might call spatial exclusion. You can't choose to live wherever you want to live. You have to, you have to either live in very poor conditions, make do for yourself, or you have to live very distant places from wherever you're working. But you suffer from a sense, not a sense, but a reality what might be called spatial exclusion. And you actually suffer the environmental distress of the city more, much more than the wealthy do. If there's a shortage of water, who suffers? If there's contamination of water, who suffers? If there's pollution in there, who suffers more? If it's getting hotter and hotter in the city, who suffers most? Right? And for all of these conditions, you maintain, you remain with a developmental disadvantage. It's tough for you to really think of your place in the city as what you might call a springboard for building a new life. You're still caught somewhere or the other. And in between, of course, you have an upwardly mobile middle class. Um, who have relative spatial inclusion, but not the same degree of choice as the wealthy would have, um, they do suffer from environmental stress and they do begin to have developmental opportunity. But now the tendencies of the upwardly mobile, uh, mobile middle class is that they are looking to live a life like the wealthy global. And on the opposite end, the struggling bottom class you know, they're they going to have, they're continuing to have increasing um, claim on natural resources and increase, increasing consumption per capita of energy. Whereas at the bottom, you have the least uh, or very little consumption of energy per capita. You have very little claim on environmental resources, you have you know, few material claims. So this is the reality of our city uh, and something that, you know, we as designers of the built environment have to find a location within. So what is it that our activity of sustainable construction, sustainable design, um, really looking to change? Maybe this is one way of looking at it that we are looking to change uh, or to find a sustainable lifestyle and a sustainable system of urban living, sustainable urban systems, where the global wealthy will reduce their consumption and their carbon footprint substantially. Just the way, you know, the theory of all these Certification systems is based. They say, well, this is your base case. So much water you're consuming, so much energy you would consume if you go building, building as usual. But now you got to do 20% less, 15% less, 40% less. 
So it's like it's imagining that your consumption levels are very high, like in the West, which you have to reduce. Now that applies definitely to our global 5%, our, our wealthy 5%. They have to reduce their consumption and their carbon footprint. And on the opposite side, there will be need to consume more. There'll be need to consume more electricity. There'll be need to consume more physical resources. And you have to raise living standards um, with moderation in consumption. And so they would need enabling measures at that end. And at the global city end, the wealthy city end, you'll need constraining measures. And in between, we hope that's what we look for, is the possibility of sustainable lifestyles and sustainable, sustainable urban living. So that's the process, broadly speaking, looking at the overall situation, that through our work, we will try to uh, move, we'll try to move this process. Okay, so changing gear a little bit. Um, so what is the challenge of a growing city? Um, I say that you must rescue it. You must recover the environment within the city. And you must also return to it the wilderness of the origi original ecology that might have pre-existed the city before it overran it. Okay? We got floods all along the West Coast now. Well, big question, but here, here is the challenge of an existing and growing city. So we are not, we're not talking about a clean slate. We're talking about uh, an inherited situation where you have to do something. And so what you are really searching for, and I'm taking the example of some work that we did many years ago for Living Cities Design Competition, which was acknowledged, interestingly, but we did it a long time ago when the search was for an evolutionary process from the ground of the existing city, from the reality of the existing city towards sustainability. And for this, we actually just chose a part of the city of Delhi, uh, which has you know, all the various things that a city would normally have and all its issues that it would normally have. And we said, okay, now from this ground, what can you do? How can you do in order to reach uh, what you might call a sustainable way of urban living? And this has three dimensions. Uh, it has a spatial dimension, organizing things on the ground, where, what goes where, how much space is taken up by what, et cetera. So there is a spatial dimension that needs organization. There is an environmental dimension in terms of what is the environmental impact of what's going on in the city, its ecological impact and its climate change impact, its impact on water. And then, of course, very importantly, there's a socioeconomic dimension about how the evolution of the city would produce greater equity, bringing you know, as we saw in the earlier diagram, bringing our society into a more equitable form. And so we thought that, you know, a designer might be someone who plays the part um, uh, in designing the physical realm as a critical agent of enabling this process of evolution. Uh, somebody who who, you know, who, who kind of makes the difference. Critical agent means making a difference, makes the difference. And that you cannot do everything all at once. Uh, you know, this idea that you must have, you know, there are many, many propositions which say, you know, these are the 10 things you must do and you must get organized, you must do them all. It's very, very difficult to conceive of. And it's not the reality of how things turn out on the ground. So you really need to consider each solution as an initiative and see how that solution can find its ground, make a beginning. And then you keep uh, connecting different solutions and different ideas 
uh, in a symbiotic sense so that they become mutually reinforcing. And then you must also then construct a vision which you must share with people of a quality of life as a physical reality that might emerge from such a process. So initiate a process wherever you can, add more processes and make them symbiotic. Uh, this is what the critical agent will try to do. And then the, it must, you must kind of project it to the future, the possibility of where you can reach. So we picked the place in the city um, and we treated that as a ground from which an intelligent evolution can be projected. And we tried to show localized action, integrating environmental sustainable system and also ensuring social equity. So this was an example of how you might go about it. Well, just some images of what we know about the city. Uh, we know that um, vehicular movement in the city is now beginning to take over so many interstitial spaces. It's just crowding us out of the city space. We know that, and this has become a big issue. Um, we also know that um, management of waste and the contamination of water has become a big issue in the cities. Uh, they are, the two things are absolutely interconnected. Um, and this is really a, a, one of the uh, features of what we call, you know, some life, uh, where the quality of life is, 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 is poor because of, primarily because of these two conditions. We know that. We also know that because of these conditions, both of them, the crowding out of uh, pollution, spewing vehicular movement in and around wherever we are living and working, and the uh, poor drainage, poor disposal of waste and treatment of waste and so on, there is stress in the city and there is disease in the city. We know this. And of course, today, coronavirus, I think we really have to think very hard about this notion of high density cities. So this was the beginning. This was the beginning of the idea. And here you have a layout plan of this part of the city in which all the orange lines here are existing motorable roads which are converted into NMT and pedestrian zones, non-motorized transport and pedestrian movement only. Uh, it is possible for emergency vehicles and essential services to reach your home, but otherwise this is, uh, you can recover this land from the hard tarmac road. And the yellow lines are the ones where regular vehicular movement still continues and they provide you the convenience of mobility across the city, connection across the city, whether it's by bus or by taxi or your own vehicle, et cetera. But the potential of this is that you actually need to commit something like 10 to 11% only of the surface land area of the city to vehicular movement, motorized vehicular movement, and still obtain uh, good connectivity and mobility, the convenience of it. And how do you withdraw from this dependence on the personalized motor vehicle? Yeah, here was an idea that on the edges of such a sector as we've just seen, you develop some buildings and these buildings are used as car parks. Uh, they are two, three stories. And then gradually what happens over a period of five to 10 years, the dependence on the motor car rises. Uh, the, the, the dependence on the motor car diminishes. Uh, costs of keeping a motor car, motor car increases. Public transportation has become better. Uh, the comfort with which you can move around in and around your streets and lanes has become very attractive. And now, uh, over a period of time, while you had bought your motor car, you had kept it on these parking lots, um, 
then they, after a period of time, these lots don't have cars anymore or have very few vehicles, but now they turn into other kinds of use, whether it is recreation or commerce or whatever it may be. But these are structures that will uh, have a different function later on. But today, they become a means of being able to withdraw the motor car from inside the fabric of the city uh, without creating a shock or a throwback from people. And then you in include, as you develop afresh some parts of the city, you include um, services which are electricity-based mobility services. Something we are beginning to see. And as you recover the street from the motor car, as you can see, the road that surrounded this park with houses all around it is now actually a recreational space and connected to the park. The park does not have a fence, the road does not have motor cars on it, and people can move around it. And the park has now been converted in its, in its treatment into a place which is a recreational space, a celebration space, and a space for collecting rainwater locally. And what used to be motor car streets have now become pedestrian streets where there's a system of treating some of the wastewater and also the possibility of growing more trees and plants. When you increase this um, to a larger scale within that part of the city, you will find that what you're wanting to do is actually reopen the natural drainage channels of the city. Um, if you reopen the natural drainage channels of the city, then you begin to once again uh, irrigate the land on either side of the drainage channels. And then this can become another way of regrowing some of the plantation that once existed over there because it is naturally irrigated. And if you do a calculation on water balance, uh, if you manage your water well, you'll find that you can actually support a greater population density than what already exists. Um, and if you are careful about the use of water and treat it and recycle it in a decentralized manner, uh, you find that uh, you can actually, I don't remember the numbers just now, but you can increase the density and still be resilient in terms of water availability. And bit by bit, as you can see, the natural ecology begins to grow around the spaces where the water drains naturally. And now with the new technology of solar PV um, and the possibility of getting some more energy out of treatment of waste, um, and also the possibility of using um, solar heating for water, um, or for solar laundries, for instance, you can do another calculation to see whether in the city you can integrate systems um, which can make you more or less um, carbon neutral in terms of energy consumption. And this calculation showed that if you planted solar trees along the roads, which are like tall structures with solar, solar PV mounted on top of them, and around the edges of parks, and you encourage people to have solar PV on their rooftops, uh, and combined with other sources of energy, 85% of the energy demand for simple living in the city could be met locally. Where places got overcrowded, you can have rules and regulations that would, over a period of time, declutter some of those spaces giving more setback, giving more light and ventilation with the possibility of urban renewal. And you can develop new typologies as the city regenerates, in which the uh, water, the, the, um, the capture of solar PV, the capture of solar heating for water, uh, the capture of rainwater, is integrated into the build fabric. Um, and there are typologies that are developed for that, for various kinds of things. So with 
varying levels of intensity, going up to five, six stories tall. And then you also find spaces within the interstices of the city, around some of its underutilized spaces, where you can provide more homes for the economically disadvantaged citizen, for which again, new typologies can be developed. And you work in such a way with the city authorities so as to make more of the open public spaces available to the public. So this idea of you know, large estates which enclose their ground, whether it is schools, whether it is colleges, whether it is hospitals, whether it is private homes or private residential societies that capture land and they become exclusively gated communities, that is gradually seen to be broken down so that more open land becomes universally or democratically accessible. And in addition to this, um, you can use the peripheral areas which are close to the main vehicular routes as a place for further densification. And all this needs to more sense of equity rather than um, segregation in the city. Democratization of open space and equity. And one more thing which ought to be part of the planning process is that each neighborhood or each sector, as in this case, needs to have a, what you might call build marts or places which are recycling units where as the city regenerates, its debris is collected, is sorted, recycled as much as possible, and it is traded with other such recycling industries uh, at the city level. Uh, and this becomes part, it's integrated into the planning of the city where locally as much material as possible is recycled. And this also becomes a place for you might call e-services and employment. As I said, you can do a calculation on water, which will show you that if you manage your water well, even in a city like Delhi, where water is generally, I mean, it doesn't rain all that much, but if you manage your water well, you know, we are quite self-sufficient in water. Maybe 10 to 15% of water has to come from a distance, but really not from a great distance, just from the river nearby. You don't have to bring the Ganga Canal all the way from great distances to feed, to, to give water to the city, city population. And the same calculation for energy too. So this is a kind of a vision. Now this is the marketplace, which is at present completely crowded at the motor cars. It's converted into something else, as you can see, with the possibility of actually growing vegetables where they're sold. And open spaces now become multi-purpose spaces where water can be stored under the open spaces and they can act as, as performance zones and you can have more energy being generated through these solar trees. And gradually, the city finds its balance. That city of, city of convergence that we were showing in the earlier diagram may be possible. Okay, now to something else. The challenge of access to this shelter for poor citizens. Um, one of the things that has become clear is that when the cities are very large and widespread geographically, when they grow very big, the per capita consumption of energy or mobility increases substantially. The cost of delivering services also increases substantially. So the city needs to be compact. But what is the degree of compactness and the nature of compactness that the city must have? And while you want to make the city compact, what is the main thing that you still have to ensure? So one of the things about making the city compact is that that romantic notion about, you know, slums are okay because it is, it is a realistic response 
according to the means of the people who are living there, they know what, how best to utilize the energies. They build their own. They should be allowed to continue as they are and over a period of time, give them patta. And you know that's the more humane way of handling the whole notion of slums. Well, I think this is not a this is not um, a sustainable solution or idea. You have to develop some different kind of institutional framework for the delivery of homes, and this is the opportunity of collective living. You have to utilize the land to its optimal density quickly. Not wait for 20, 30 years, 40 years before you get to two-story, three-story, or four-story construction. You need to be able to do that quickly. It's when you do that quickly, then life in the city gets better serviced because the services become affordable thanks to the density. And everybody has access to the basic necessities of life in the city. Well, the present situation is that most people have to provide for themselves. And, um, and the story is that when, I, when you move into the city, when I move into the city, I'm, for the first time, I'm, I'm an itinerant immigrant or a temporary immigrant. And this is the condition of all our folk who return to their villages when Corona lockdown was announced. So there's a huge bunch of people who have to live in small shacks or in very poor rented accommodation, five, six people to a small room, et cetera. Uh, and who provides for it? It is the self-build and small construction that's provide for, that provides for all of these people. It's only when you get a settled immigrant situation that formal methods of providing homes become a little bit accessible. And it is when you have become an established tax-paying, property-owning citizen, you become an established citizen with your Aadhaar card, not only your Aadhaar card, your, your vote, voting card, etc. When you actually become a citizen, um, then, and you have stability of employment, regular employment, that is when you can access finance, where what we call, you know, builder built or group housing schemes, whether it is governmental or private, become available to you. And still much of it is self-built. Uh, some of it is community built and medium in size, and very little of this is actually built by large developers. So what was now being recognized is there's a great need for rental housing at the base to provide for the base of this pyramid. Once again, for us designers, this is an area of work that we really have to devote ourselves to. The development of housing typologies for, uh, to make housing affordable for majority of people in the city. For some strange reason, actually not a strange reason, because of the way the, the market, the free market, of land is being manipulated and controlled, there is a growing belief that we have to go vertical and that's the only way. But the fact is that growing vertical is going away from sustainability. It costs much more to build. When you build tall, as you can see in these numbers, and a very tall building is simply not affordable for most people. Six, seven stories, yes, some people can afford that much to live in, to look after, pay the running bills, to buy. But most people would find a three, four story type of construction more affordable to live in, to look after, and to buy. And life in a small home uh, is crowded. Um, and so the outdoor spaces mean a lot. Uh, that is the compensation for the small home. And it is, uh, you know, the size of the home or the per capita space available inside the home is a direct indication of the quality of life. And while you can afford a small home, but it, is, it is work, becomes workable only when it is associated with outdoor spaces 
which you can consider as extensions of home. I won't go into this data, but we move on. But it is important that for the small home, there is compensatory open space. There are ways of handling living on many floors. And this is a uh, something that we tried out and it has worked quite well, is to think of streets in the air where you can have neighbors and it's a place where people can be around and children can be looked after. And it becomes a bit more of a neighborhood. And the hesitation of living upstairs thereby comes down. And this has been tried out. Uh, this typology has been tried out for small homes uh, in two or three projects, and it seems to work quite effectively. The early hesitation that some people had has now disappeared. One of the big issues, it's a theoretical issue in all design for the anonymous client is what is the typology that is suitable? And so actually in our office, for one project, we went about it very systematically. Developed after having meetings with prospective buyers, we developed three or four different types of home, which we thought could be afforded by families that are getting 10 to 15,000 rupees a month. They can put out three to 5,000 rupees a month as their EMI. What could you afford? Oh, about you know, 30 square meters max, uh, but more like 25 square meters. So we worked out a number of typologies for that. And then we conducted a series of meetings with different groups of people, asking them to use uh, some little blocks to see how each family would use their own home. And it was interesting to find that each family, every single family had a different way of using their home. Every single family had a different way of using their home. And it gave us a real lesson that, you know, to design small homes that can suit and be adequate, and provide the platform for growth of a family for different kinds of families is something that we really have to learn. And this voting actually dwindled down the typologies to three. The other thing that we worked on was ways of building a low carbon in construction. So many uh, options were studied and this was a very interesting one where you have a hollow block masonry which could be partially reinforced and this is called constrained masonry, reducing the consumption of steel to something like 2.2 kg per square foot of built area delivered very low embodied energy. And similar ideas for building a floor slab, reduce the steel consumed very important. And then you actually built it. You built the full structure. You finished it. You, you populated it with furniture and artifacts of living. For a family. And you lived in it and you watched yourself living in it. So this was an amazing experiment for us, actually building and using a place that we have built as if we were the occupants and learning from that process and then refining the design. All kinds of little things went into the refinement of the design. And then there was the idea that there would be um, each neighborhood, would have a neighborhood structure. It would have a market street. It would have a main place. It would have three or four different types of homes and different kinds of open spaces, more like a small town rather than what, we, what people call a layout. Okay? So conceiving an identity for a community as a neighborhood, as a place to which you can give a name is also important. And there is the infrastructure. Well, what we discovered was that actually solar PV on the rooftops of small homes, if you work it out with some of the solar PV providers today, there are companies that will give you, that hire a rooftop, give you solar PV at a fixed rate, 
uh, give you electricity at a fixed rate, and it can meet 70 to 80% of your demand, right? If your four to five stories high. You can have decentralized methods of treating your waste and treating your water. And these decentralized methods, which can be uh, worked out for communities of 400 or 500 homes at the smallest scale, it could go up to larger scale, but they can be all designed in such a way that when the city system comes into being, they could be connected. So this actually becomes an enabling developmental process. You don't say, I will not give you approval unless and until you're connected to the municipality. Or you will not be able to develop your own water. We will bring you the water from the water supply system of the city. Um, you're not allowed to develop your own water. And then you'll have to wait for five years before we can bring it to you. And then there'll be shortage. So decentralized methods um, are proving to be economical enough to provide for the essential needs of, uh, of neighborhoods. Low cost, affordable neighborhoods. So decentralized electricity, recycling of waste, sewage treatment, and water supply. The challenge of designing homes that are affordable is that you have to make sure that the basics are provided health and sanitation, safety, and sustainability, or what you might call the environmental services, water conservation, handling of waste, energy efficiency, biodiversity. And then that becomes the foundation from which a future life of self-fulfillment can be built. So the design that ensures the basics, guarantees the basics, but provides a platform where you can envision a, a self-fulfilling life in the future is what is required. So making affordable a future from caring for the present today to enabling people themselves and communities themselves of their will to develop their lives in the future. So this might be what the future would look like. This is a very important statement for me. Um, you know, we talked about high rise building and the general belief that you have to go tall. Land is short, you have to go tall. Why is land short? It is that if the conception of the city, what is a city, if that conception is that it is an instrument of wealth generation through the exploitation of land by real estate, then, this is my hypothesis, we are doomed to perpetuation of a divided city where half the population lives under environmental and legal stress. The fact that we have so much slums and they perpetuate is a function of the imagination of the city as a place where wealth is generation generated by the exploitation of land by real estate. You can see this in Lagos, you can see this in Caracas, you can see this in Jakarta, in Jakarta, you can see this in Manila, you can see this in Bangalore, you can see this in Ahmedabad, you can see it in all the big cities that is there. It's a it's that. But if you say that the conception of the city, that it is a development engine for distribution of wealth within the framework of environmental sustainability, then we are on a sustainable path. And we need to design this development process of the city with this as its salient objective. This requires political will and change in our, I would say, rules and regulations and the philosophy of what the city is. Uh, it will, unless I think we get there and we as agents of change have to play our role in making this happen, at least to enable people, enable people to see this conundrum that we are caught in. So we have to turn it around and say that the city itself, urbanization itself, is the engine 
for equitable social and economic development. It is not the engine that will perpetuate disparity and environmental stress. And this is the opportunity of collective living. I want to share very quickly with you some research that was done again three, four years ago uh, on objectively looking at three typologies of affordable homes. A low rise, which is four, four to five stories high, medium rise, six to seven, eight stories high, and high rise, 12 stories plus. We looked at real projects in the city of Rajput, we got all the data, and we did some analysis. And this is what we found. If you looked at the embodied energy of construction, then you found, just look at the uh, numbers here, need not think too much about the units, because it's kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions per square meter of built area. Leave that out for, for a little while. But you can see that when you are four stories or so, the number is 233, you go to seven stories, the number has risen to 251. And if you go taller than that, it starts rising sharply. And here, the number is 310. In other words, the taller you go, the greater the embodied energy of construction, principally because of the steel that is consumed in making the building stay up against earthquake forces, against wind forces, and gravity as well. But as we go stay low rise, we have 15 to 20 to 35% less embodied energy. And embodied energy is a very crucial element in, uh, in climate change, especially in India, because most of the building that we are going to do in the, over the next two, three de decades is going to be very low operational energy. It'll be low, low operational energy. It won't be high operational energy. And the rate at which we are building and the scale at which we are building, it is the building materials themselves, the construction materials that go into, our, into the provision of built space that is going to be the cause of carbon dioxide emissions in places like India. It is going to be the salient feature. So low embodied energy construction is extremely important. And we found that most of the embodied energy is consumed in the basic structural system and the external envelope of the building. 65 to 70% of embodied energy of construction is attributable to these two things. And so, once again, you find that if you build low rise, low embodied energy. Build high rise, high embodied energy. And when you build low rise, you can even choose materials which are relatively low embodied energy to build with and have much less steel and concrete. Same with operational energy of the building, of the building system. It's common services, it's lifts, it's pumps, and other common services. Low rise, very little energy consumed. High rise, an awful lot. How many times more it is? My gosh. It's, you know, it's, so the operational energy of building increases phenomenally as you go taller. Maintenance cost goes up phenomenally as you go taller because maintaining lifts, replacing lifts, maintaining the fire safety system, and so on. All of this goes up phenomenally as you go taller. Even the efficiency of floor area reduces as you go taller because more and more space is consumed by structure and safety services. And we looked at this, this relationship between outdoor space and indoor space When you build low rise and you have access to balconies, the ground and roof terraces as being close to your home, go up one story, go down two stories, et cetera, or go out onto a balcony, et cetera. Low rise gives you more open area per capita compared to high rise at the same densities, okay? Because if you're on the eighth floor, you cannot consider the ground as being your open space is just too far away. If you're on the fourth floor, you cannot consider the roof as being your open space. It's just too far away. So proximity of open space is what matters. 
And this was the most interesting finding of all. If you devote a certain percentage of your rooftop to capturing the sun for energy, then if you're four or five stories tall, you can meet 83% of your annual requirements for simple living with this rooftop energy. And as you go taller and taller, that potential keeps going down. So if you're talking about low carbon urban systems, if you're talking about low carbon urban living, we are certainly not talking about high rise. We're talking about low rise, where the buildings rise above the tree line, have access to the sun, and the roof area is sufficient for you to provide electricity for the four or five stories that are below the roof. That's the pattern of the city that can work for the future. And you put all of this together, all our findings together, okay? Open area per person, embodied energy, operational energy, solar roof potential, et cetera, et cetera. Put them all together. What is it that you come up with? I'll leave this one out. You come up with this. That the city of the future that will be sustainable will be a low rise, high density city. And these are some numbers. What kind of dwelling units per hectare you can get, how much open space you can have, what will be the cost of construction, what will be a solar potential. And for the state of Gujarat, how much less carbon dioxide emissions you'll have compared to the medium and high rise construction that everybody is racing towards right now. Add to that, construction time is quicker and more people, more contractors, more people in the building trades can be engaged in the making of these buildings which are smaller grain, simpler to build. They are a better opportunity for the distribution of wealth in the making of the city itself. Not to forget that simple things like shading, ventilating, and insulating according to the climate have to be built into the design, have to be built into the design. It should be the standard and the norm. Nobody needs to be told this. But this is what we see. Architects are doing this. I'm just amazed. This is what architects are doing. See what the people on the right-hand side have done? They can't bear it. They have to close the windows from the outside. Okay. Last shot. This is something that was done many years ago when President Kalam was Rashtrapati. And a visionary man that he was said that this Rashtrapati Bhavan should be energy self-sufficient. Give me a proposal. So with the Tata at that time, the Terry Tata Energy Research Institute, we developed a proposal for a convention center, an office center, which would provide the energy required for itself, the convention center and the office block, but also for the Rashtrapati Bhavan and its grounds. And this is how it worked. The device was a solar tree, which rose some four stories above the ground, cleared the tree line, became a shade roof under which buildings could be built. The roof of the buildings would be roof gardens. And the earth that is taken out for the basements of the foundations would be used back in the walls of the buildings. Again, three to four stories tall. And this is what it might look like if you saw it from the skies. Where the natural trees are, you leave out the roof, uh, the, um, the solar tree. But the solar tree was also a structural element. It was a 12 meter grid which allowed 12 meter grid subdivided into a six meter grid, which also served as the grid according to which the buildings would be built. This is just some views of how it might be. And the amazing thing was that we produced some five megawatts of electricity using this system, which looked after the needs of this center as well as that of Rashtrapati Bhavan. So here's the idea of the possibility of an urbanism of the hot and humid climates or the hot climates, shaded open spaces 
which at the same time, uh, the shading system pro provides electricity. So, to recapitulate, we are looking for enhancing this process, constraining measures for the global city, enabling measures for the marginalized city, in search of a sustainable lifestyle and sustainable urban systems. That the conception of the city is that it is a development engine for the distribution of wealth within the framework of environmental sustainability. That the city is the engine for equitable social and economic development, not the other way around. And that the solution probably lies in the direction of low rise, compact density, compact, low rise, high density, compact cities. And this will happen when we, designers of the built environment, which actually includes not only architects, but many other disciplines that are engaged with the built environment, together become development practitioners and environmental stewards while we produce cultural artifacts. Thank you. Rather long, I'm afraid, but there we are. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, can you please stop sharing your screen? So yeah. wonderfully thought-provoking presentation. And what was really interesting to see in this presentation was not just the theory, but its application at three different scales and also three different types, I think probably. So starting from the first project that you showed, which was at the level of the city, how the same philosophy activates. Then at the level of the housing and particularly the affordable housing, which is the real issue at the moment, the, what we do with the slums. And at that scale, your findings have been really, really eye openers. And then lastly, to see something at the building level in the Rashtrapati Bhavan that you showed. So I think it was an apt demonstration of this philosophy at three different scales. And that was something that was really wonderful to see in your presentation. I would like to invite Jigna to uh, take from this point onwards and sort of initiate the discussion. Thank you very much, Ayaz. Uh, how much time do we have? Because I have a lot that I, I think so much to take from this presentation. That I have endless number of points that I want to discuss with uh, Professor Lal. So it, I, it's all up to Professor Ashok Lal. Okay. Yeah. Paas hai. Paas hai. Excellent. No, I think it was wonderful that you linked the question of sustainability to the question of equity rather than the question of scarcity. What we have been seeing so far, and generally the kind of theories and the kind of discussions that go around the issue of sustainability is always that we, we have very little and, and which we do, I'm not saying we don't have, we, we do have limited resources, but to constantly keep on talking about limited resources can end up in the discussion or the or in the direction of eventually saying, well, eventually the resources are going to run out and eventually we are doomed. But I think the moment you link it with question of accessibility and equity to res uh, about resources, it really opens up uh, immense possibilities that you presented. So I think that that was um, that. Thank you for doing that. I think it was a it was a shift in the way one uh, views uh, sustainability and then the solutions that you provided in terms of strategies, in terms of uh, uh, you you linked it to the question of I think there are various strategies that you use the question of carbon credit America's talk um, talk about green deal and we talk about certification system so these are strategies to um, do the equitable dist mm -hmm. distribution what I also really uh, enjoyed watching in your in your presentation is that invariably people say that if uh, if the upper middle class or, or the, as you said the aspiring group of people and the rich people, if they are the only ones 
with whom we can talk about sustainability because poor um, don't necessarily, I mean, rightfully so. You showed the Maslow's hierarchy of need where you say that they're struggling for their basic needs and they may not talk about, they may not kind of be uh, linked to the question of sustainability where you spoke about how if there is a change, if the people who can uh, start producing their own electricity, if the people who can start producing their own water and if, the, if there are systems that can support uh, creating your own or developing your own water and your own energy, um, the, the accessibility to the public energy and the public water systems to the people who can't afford to develop their own uh, becomes, opens up. So there is that relationship of people who can, if they produce their own energy and they produce their own uh, water or they, they, they kind of preserve their own water or uh, conserve their own water, the possibility of public waters open up for others. So I think these are some very interesting um, uh, lessons to take from what you presented. Uh, there was, a, I'll start, it's, you know, the, your first, there's a first question that I have, that you spoke about public spaces, which can generate, I mean, of course, a better quality of life in the, um, uh, kind of upper middle class residences of the city um, where there's, if, if we have public spaces, we can possibly gen use them for generation of water. They can be parks, they can be public spaces. And I think you, your, your starting point was to say that this will rely on freeing up parking spaces. That if people reduce their dependencies on vehicle, there's a possibility of freeing up road spaces, parking spaces, and that's where um, my my question is that this requires two things. One is that it requires infrastructure for people to reduce their dependence on vehicles, and it requires behavioral change because even where places that have infrastructure, um, the people still find it more convenient to take a car rather than um, take, take the public uh, and use the public mobility services. So um, what, what are your reflections on how can these behavioral changes be introduced to people who can afford a car? Now they went, I mean, affording petrol is more difficult now, but afford a car and use the car. Mm -hmm. And that, that the dependency on vehicles seems, does not seem to be reduced. Yeah. Very, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a tough one because um, it's um, if you look at is if you look at this uh, the dependency on the personalized motor vehicle as a progressive phenomenon, mm -hmm. um, you will you will recognize that. Um, the moment I can afford a motorcycle, I'll abandon my bicycle. Mm. I'll buy a motorcycle. And then the moment I can buy a small car, uh, I would probably keep the motorcycle for some, someone in the family uh, and also have a motor car. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of people who are transitioning from the present state of um, having to use bicycle or public transport into having a personalized motor car. And it's also interesting to see that the it's 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 a converse situation, very, very funny. That when you have a big city, right, say in Mumbai, mm -hmm. or now you can talk of Ahmedabad, you can talk of Delhi, Bangalore. Um, that many people who were going to buy a motor car, have a motorcycle, are not buying a motor car because it's one hell of a drag, mm. taking it all the way and it takes longer and you can't, you can't be sure whether you'll reach or not. But so long as you don't have to call at 10 different places in the, in the course of the day, you will take the metro or take the bus, mm. okay? If it is convenient enough. So it, so, so uh, a strategy of developing public transportation 
and what we call last mile collectivity. Mm. And the comfort of the pedestrian zone reduces this, the rate at which this conversion occurs. Mm. Right? So that's one part of it. The rate at which this conversion occurs certainly reduces if you supplement. This is what happened in Europe. Mm. Mm. You know, there was a motor car dependency at one time, but now people have shifted. You know, shifted. In Berlin, it's, it's amazing. They're saying that the demand for uh, motor vehicle driving licenses for the age group below 35 has gone down enormously. Nobody wants to buy. Nobody mm. wants to drive a car anymore. Mm. You just don't feel the necessity. Take a cab, take a bus, go on a cycle, whatever, you know. So I think that's, that's one thing. The second part of, uh, if you are already into your motor car, upper middle class, you're already into your motor car, how will you ever give it up? Mm. All right? And now, unless you are able to give it up, mm. you will not be able to release the ground from the motor car, mm. right, where it is already being occupied. Mm. And this occupation of the ground is being reinforced oh, by all these rules about parking standards. My God, how stupid they are. Yeah. Oh, Baba, before, I mean, like, before you can build your home on the fourth floor, you have to build one full basement and three podium floors dedicated to Mr. Motokar, puja karo, sab kuch karo, before you can think of building a super kitchen. What crazy world it is, mm -hmm. right? So I think um, you have to work in two directions. You have to say, um, and you know, this, this has been tried. For, you know, in Tokyo, what they did, they said, you build, you can provide parking wherever you like. Uh, you can build multi-story parking if you like, but it is all treated as FAR space. Mm. It's your FAR. Use it for whichever you like. Mm. Okay, mm. It's FAR. It's not outside FAR because it is not the city infrastructure. That mm. parking space is not the city infrastructure. Mm. Mm. If there is parking space provided by the city, that's the city infrastructure. Mm. But for private development, we don't, we just say it is FAR. Yeah. So the most expensive restaurants in, in Tokyo buy the neighboring plot of land where the Bentleys and the Mercedes can come and park. All right? That's what they do. Mm -hmm. But it's the most expensive restaurant in town. Mm -hmm. you know? So you, you then, you, 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 know, you work it out in such a way that it's, it's, it's not economically uh, the most advantageous thing for you to do. It's the other way around. Now, I may not want to have a motor car, all right? But it's being provided for me by the builder, mm. all right? The place is being provided for me by the builder and the builder is saying you have to pay so much money for it. What the hell? Mm. I don't want it. No, but it's been paid. I mean, it's part of my deal. It's the opposite way around. So you're being forced to invest. All right, now what you need to do, I think, is to locate places where cars can be parked, as I showed, at, you know, find spots where you can do, make it two story, three story style, four story store, and say, okay, you can, you park here, there's a dental involved, and it's just five minutes walk from your home. Mm -hmm. Five minutes, seven minutes walk from your home. Um, and that's what you do. And at the moment you can perhaps park one car close to your home then gradually you wean away from it. So there needs to be a very carefully constructed strategy. It will not take less than 10 years for this behavioral change to occur, but it has to be instigated. It has to be catalyzed by mm. various pulls and pushes. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. In fact, it reminded me of this uh, discussion that one of my colleague has where he says that on a roadside, if a hawker is standing, mm. uh, the municipality uh, will charge that hawker 
to stand there. Yeah. But if you are parking your private car somewhere, it's free. Yeah, so, it's free. And it's, that's where the inequity kind of also is uh, seen. That's right. That's that, uh, right. People with car are actually given more access to space of the city. I know. It's, 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 a crazy yeah. it's, it's, it's because those who set the rules are like that only. You know? yeah, yeah. 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 They are invested in this. Yeah. Uh, Prutha, if there are any other questions, just interrupt. And between two questions, you can just ask because I have, I can go on. So if there's any question. That is there on social media. You can ask now or I'll move on to the next one. I think you can move on. I'll go on. Okay. Uh, the other uh, this thing was related to uh, the, um, I, I think the other thing that I found very refreshing is that uh, you mentioned that it's not okay to romanticize slums. And I think that's... Uh, I really do. I feel so strongly about it. I, I agree with you because there, I mean, I have, I, I studied in the 90s when uh, these all strategies uh, about uh, slum uh, rehabilitation programs were going on, and there were discussions about let people like what you were saying that mm. let you know people have already are already there and let them uh, just kind of consolidate their structures. But when you see the quality of life, one realizes that mm. uh, only somebody extremely privileged would say something like that, and people who who are actually would living in that situation would of course want to get out of that place, would want a, be want a better life. So I think, uh, once again, thank you for saying that. And I, in, I, my question to you is that in your experience of doing projects like these, uh, and uh, I think it was from 70s that these discussions are going on about uh, low-income housing. I think Doshi uh, spoke about it a lot, uh, Korea spoke about it a lot. Um, and the, the original discussions uh, in the 60s about oh, that John Turner, Ivan Illich, um, many of them in 90s, these discussions, there were, there were these projects, but either they were one-off projects or they did not become a kind of a, uh, you know, they, they, they did not become a system where mm -hmm. uh, there can actually be provision of housing the way you were talking about that there are different stages of migration and different stages mm -hmm. of uh, uh, permanence or temporality that people live mm. in the cities. Uh, what do you think has changed? Uh, do you think anything has become more conducive for these kind of uh, approaches? I tell you what has changed. It's changed for the worse mm. um, because the neoliberal economy or the, the mindset of the new the new, new, new liberal economics has taken over all the captains of the city. Mm. Whether it is the politicians, whether it is the administrators, whether it is big business. They believe that leave it to the market and the market will do the work. Mm. Okay? This is a belief. Even the PMAY, uh, different verticals, uh, eventually say that you have some, you have something called the PPP model, right? Mm -hmm. um, and many policies that have been written by different states, each state writes its own affordable housing policy now. Rajasthan has one of the best ones, I would say, but you have Haryana, you have Karnataka, they all write their own statement. Mumbai is the worst, okay? So they, they write their policy as a part of a business model, right? So you are given incentives to provide 10% homes of this size. Mm. Build more FSI, or you get something else for free or whatever it is. So there is a combination of a little bit of a rule, compulsion, and some incentive. And it is all seen as a negotiation with business interest. Mm. Because it is real estate that is developing the city. That's the golden goose. Mm. Right? The real estate is the golden goose. Now the golden goose has completely taken over, taken over everybody's imagination. Mm. Mm. What state has withdrawn itself from is its role in devising land policies that make 
land at appropriate location at appropriate prices accessible to half the population of the city. Mm. It has withdrawn itself from that. It only feels, so what you do, you pussyfoot around it. You're never able to solve the problem, mm -hmm. right? And the great slum rehabilitation, Bombay wala scheme, kya kehlata ho? Where you build, the builder comes and the builder has to build, they follow, they're following this in Delhi now. Yeah, yeah. The builder has to rehouse everybody who's living there, conduct a survey, give them temporary accommodation, rehouse everybody who's living there into mm -hmm. tall buildings. And the land that is opened up, you can sell in the open market. Mm -hmm. So the sale in the open market must be sufficiently profitable for the developer to pay for this entire process of survey, negotiation, getting approval, um, temporary housing, reconstruction, handing over, free of charge, right? Out of the profits to be made from the open sale portion. Mm -hmm. So it's a very high level of cross subsidy. Mm -hmm. So there are no more buyers for this scheme. Because at that very high level, you know, five crore ka ghar, five crore ka, ten crore ka ghar, wo baaj khatam ho gaye. Unke paas hai, wo grease chalega sabke sab. Koi zaroori nahi hai, you know. So this this dependence on the business model of real estate is the change that has gone the wrong way. Instead of stepping back and saying, you have to make land available that is affordable. If the city is going to be an engine for the distribution of wealth, of the distribution of equitable opportunity. Mm. You have to do it. Take the case of Singapore. Mm. You know what Singaporeans did, or the government did, somewhere I think 1989 or something, they passed a law where they reserved the right to purchase lands in certain specified zones of the island for building their townships, which are all these housing board townships. Um, first right to purchase and fix the price. They fix the price, 1989. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then in the heart of town, on the side of the sea, they reclaimed land, built amaz amazing infrastructure, sold it in the global market, made packets of money, mm -hmm. and built the townships. Mm -hmm. 80% of Singaporeans live in housing board flats for which they are able to pay out of their own incomes. Mm. Just imagine. So it was the state who took the initiative. It didn't rely on the market to do the job. Mm -hmm. It modified the market behavior to, to give 80% of the population, of the national population, access to decent housing. And all the housing is being maintained and managed by the housing board itself. Mm. Okay. So this withdrawal of the state is what has happened. Mm. You know? mm. And the and the private builders are not seeing the seeing any value in the in creating low in kind of low rise high density. Okay. So this is interesting. The private builders are seeing some value in this. Mm. More active in the smaller towns. Mm. Okay. where land is still not expensive and the distance of where you build from the heart of the city where the employment is or the school is or the market is, hospital is, all that, where all the services that the city provides is not too far away. Mm. Okay, so it is, it is sort of working in the small city, second tier, third tier city. It has an uptake. But I think it needs much more Philip. It needs uh, you know, more catalyzing and more enabling by mm -hmm. working out a land policy where land can be reserved for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think uh, that's that's quite. Um, I mean, I'm, it just reminded me when you said that we've taken the turn for reverse. It mm -hmm. reminded me that documentary of two thousand nine uh, by Franny Armstrong. It was called The Age of Stupid. 
that we know the problems. <laughs> we know that it, the solutions to the problems there have been they've been tried out, but we sort of seem to be going in the reverse direction because I think what you pointed out in your last uh, the, one of those last slides that fundamentally the way we see the city is mm. a problem. What we want from the city is is what we need. It's an, it needs to be a paradigm shift at that level for That's us true. to uh, act That's in a particular solution. True. I think the last uh, discussion that I want to have is close to the way I work and what I do, and I want to uh, kind of um, uh, kind of understand your reflections on it. Um, I work in the area of conservation, and I think when you were talking about the role of an architect or role of a designer as a creator of exquisite cultural artifacts, as a developmental practitioner and a steward of environment, I see that. Uh, um, it's all three aspects are linked to the question of built environment conservation. One is that uh, the historic built environment that has cultural value is something that can already provide a sense of belonging to the people. Once again, referring to the hierarchy of needs, that it can already provide that sense of uh, belonging and the sense of identity to the people. And it is, uh, they are cultural art artifacts that somebody in past has produced and they are valuable. Uh, for the other two aspects, the role of uh, a, a designer as a developmental practitioner, as a steward of environment, many countries, and especially in the, in the developing countries, they are seeing the existing built environment as an existing building stock that is already built. And I think in your presentation, you spoke about the question of regeneration, that you said that existing built environments can be regenerated in a more sustainable manner. Uh, and I, I also want to bring in two concepts and two aspects. One, one is the, uh, you know, the, the, the Pritzker Prize winner uh, in 2021, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Black Asian and Russell who won the prize there, they're, they won it because they work on the question of restorative environment. They take existing buildings, buildings that are abandoned and they uh, regenerate them for new uses. They have hardly built new buildings. And I think that's a direction for designers that's very interesting and useful that I, I, I find. And the other, the other concept that I want to link is the question of uh, what, what I use in my private practice with Nehul, what we call urban mining, that even when we are building new environment, uh, new buildings, and you talk about the, the structural system and the materials also in your presentation. What we do is that we look at the possibility of reusing existing materials, existing bricks that are lying around or uh, recreating new building blocks from the construction base that is lying around. Uh, what do you see is the, I'm, 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 I'm sure it's very difficult to quantify, but do you think that these ideas and these concepts can have a, a role in addressing the question of equity and the question of uh, uh, access of resources to a larger masses um, or exact access to built spaces because a lot of this existing even historic built environment is occupied by the by the poor they're occupied by the migrants so I, I just want to know your reflections on it that what is the role you think it can play in the question of sustainability and the question of equity. Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's um, it's an important mention, uh, and certainly there's a great potential there. Um, let me just cast my mind over it. Um, so let let's take let's take um, the the old city in Ahmedabad as a, mm -hmm. as a reference. We can also take the old city of Delhi, Shah Jahanabad, as a reference. Okay. Now. The difference between Shah Jahanabad and Ahmedabad is this, that there are stretches of the inner city of Shah Jahanabad which have, um, which have now got into uh, multiple ownerships. Mm. And they've got hopelessly built over and hopelessly modified. Hopelessly modified. 
And the folks are staying there simply because they're tied to that place. They don't have an alternative. Um, mm. Our family had relatives who were living in a rented home in the heart of the city. Uh, some trader came and he wanted to expand his warehousing facility and he offered them money. They bought, they took the money and bought a small DDA flat immediately. Mm. Left and went, you know, mm. and it over the old place, old Havili. Now, so there is, there is an economic process where that very fabric is threatened. Mm. Its utility is being withdrawn, is being, you know, uh, is being spoiled. Uh, and the capacity of the existing residents is not adequate to, to resuscitate it, mm. all right, uh, to put it into use. So that's, that's one kind of situation we are facing. Also, it so happens in Delhi that um, progressively uh, the traders, as their trades have expanded, have converted more and more Havelis into, into warehouses, into go-downs. Mm. They've been doing that. So this, this, there's an economic shift that's going on. So now, whereas in Ahmedabad, it's not like that. In mm. Ahmedabad, there is still a stability of life. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, you know, how people manage with, you know, char bachche hain, unka kya hoga? and where they go, what happens, whether you build inside or what you do, I don't know whether you regenerate inside or not. Now you, you compare this situation of ours, I'm saying that Ahmedabad, where the old fabric still exists. And if you look after it nicely, if you can find the economic model, mm-hmm. uh, where there's money to look after it uh, and that it adds to, let's say, the quality of life and adds to the productive life of all those who are living there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, life, economic life comes back mm-hmm. and it, it begins to flourish like the old town. Yeah. It begins to flourish. Then it, as has happened in many European old cities. Mm-hmm. Contrast this with the European situation, which is what we are talking about, the Pitzer Prize, um, Pitzer Prize. They were faced with the abandonment of the city. Mm. The old city was abandoned and people moved out into the suburbs. Uh, And so it was a question of abandon, but still full of potential. Mm. It needs the Im- an imagination to bring economic life back into it. Mm. Okay, so that's another condition where the place is abandoned but must be rehabilitated. Mm. Okay, so I I just feel that each of these requires a different approach, yeah. a different approach. But the 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 use of old crafts, recycling of material. Um, the richness of environment that you can produce, the mm. meaning that is infused and embedded in all the stories that hang around the faces of buildings, you know, um, is a wealth you cannot lose. You mm. just cannot lose it. It must, it must be kept alive. Even when it's like a palimpsest where, you know, there are many generations of stories built into, built into a home or built into andar jao to kuch hai. Mm. You know, bahar jao to kuch hai. All kinds of things happen, but they are beautiful stories, all of them. Mm. So I think that that liveliness still is there, and it this this is one area of work where you have to be very close to the ground. Mm. You know, each little thing has its own particular solution and yeah. approach, yeah. Yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, so surely it, it's absolutely valid, and it's one of the ways of. You know, utilizing the resource that you have mm-hmm. and infusing it with a new life. Mm-hmm. Right? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, th- that's it. I think that these are the kind of uh, discussions that these are the discussions I wanted to have. It's already, I think, quarter to one. So I asked if 
there's anything that you want to ask or there are any other questions i i really enjoyed the discussion between between the two of you and uh, like professor ashok lal was talking about sajana bad there are many parts of amdabad old city also who are similarly going through this kind of a stressed condition yes. they are kind of i think they are all different kind of conditions within yes. us acha acha wo bhi hai parts that are like shahjahan abad there are parts that are abandoned yes. Yes. there are parts that are that still have potential of people living okay. you see productivity in that and so you rightly said that every part needs to be looked at very specific to what it is you know, i i i use two words which which are very helpful i use you know it's common enough does use the word catalyst mm. and lever mm. so एक कैटलिस्ट वो चीज है जो कुछ छोड़ दी तो वो इट स्टार्ट्स इट इट जनरेट्स अ प्रोसेस इन अ सर्टेन डायरेक्शन सो इफ यू आर वेरी क्लेवर अबाउट योर कैटलिस्ट व्हाट इज द थिंग दैट यू डू इट सेट्स समथिंग इन मोशन देन दैट इज द थिंग टू थिंक अबाउट बिकॉज़ यू एज आई सेड यू कैन नॉट डू अ कॉम्प्रिहेंसिव जॉब द अदर इज द आइडिया ऑफ द लीवर लुक फॉर दोस थिंग्स दैट हैव अ मल्टीप्लायर बेनिफिट Hmm. थोड़ी सी एफर्ट में बहुत फायदा हुआ hmm. Hmm? वो कौन सी चीज है कि जो कि छोड़ी सी एफर्ट में बहुत फायदा देगी वो क्या चीज है स्मॉल प्रोजेक्ट इन ए स्मॉल विलेज अर्बन विलेज एन एन जी ओ वॉन्टेड टू वॉज एन ओल्ड शेड एंड टू बिल्ड मल्टीपर्पज काइंड ऑफ बिल्डिंग दे सेम ट्रिक्स वो पुराना सामान था उसको दोबारा से इस्तेमाल किया गांव की सारी खिड़की दरवाजे पुराने वाले लेके हम ले आ गए एंड देन उसी उसी मिट्टी से बेसमेंट की मिट्टी से दीवारें बना दी ऑल दिस और थिंग वी डिड एग्जैक्टली व्हाट यू सेड बट इट्स इंटरेस्टिंग दैट हैज बिकम अ कैटलिस्ट ओवर देयर ओके पर सर ये भी कर सकते हैं क्या अच्छा अच्छा खासा हो जाता है अच्छा खासा हो जाता है यू नो लाइक दैट इट्स इंटरेस्टिंग I I, yeah, I want to uh, uh, take this uh, point that you made about being a catalyst and being minimal intervention when you uh-huh. cannot be a catalyst. And I want to come back to the point of the slums and the affordable housing that you talked about. Mm. We talk about the slums and the affordable housing. There are various ways and various uh, in which people have proposed. Yeah. and some of the discussions are also centered around like for example if you look at the existing slums it is not just the houses but it has a lot of social patterns the relationships between the families which are been living there the livelihoods of the people who are living there now when i all of a sudden intervene take them out of that put them into 10 15 kilometers away from the city even in, in in order to build new set of housing for the very same very set of people there is uh, a fear of of losing those uh, those social connections uh, the social capital or i would rather say which is there in the existing fabric which has a value and so then people try and find uh, various other ways in which okay how can this be done in incrementally or then uh, can this catalyst approach or the minimal uh, intervention that you just spoke about could be taken as as also as an approach towards some of the slums what 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 would be your your take on that yeah i think yeah surely of course it can be and you know where where communities are well established right um and so the the first concern is is the location within the city wherever you are and there's a reason for being there right so you don't want to move out of that place because kaam ka rishta hai jo kuch bhi hai the school bachche school mein ja rahe hain etc etc so there's a whole whole thing there's a reason for being where you are in the city geographic reason location then um uh you have neighbors you have activities you have friends um and they all have their histories and then you then you are a, you are a community right? you are a community 
And so you, you don't want to be disturbed as a community. Obviously, you don't want to be disturbed. So um, there, are, there, there is, you know, there are several approaches to this. There is the incremental, Pattado incremental approach. Um, as is, where is, rebuild the home, as was done by Mashal in Pune, right? They've done a number of projects like that and very, very successful. There have been others, say, in Indore, where you you shifted, say, just um, into an open ground nearby, built new stuff there, and moved as a community out there. All right? And then you enable something new to be built where you were living earlier. But you locate, you're still located where you wish to be located. Um, you, you have to... You have, you're, in, you're engaged with the process of the new arrangement that's being made. Why sab log niche nahi rahenge, kuch log upar bhi rahenge, aur zina hoga, ya yahan khuli jagah hogi, etc., etc. So that, but you are aware of the new arrangement that's being made, and you make a choice. You make a choice. Yes, I think it's better to go out there, right? So it requires a. So for existing slum conditions. It requires actually a, a deep participative approach for people at the center and a solution that is appropriate for them and better for them and also better for the city, which is part of this thing. You know, if, if, uh, if we are located where it gets flooded every monsoon, you know, not only does it get flooded every monsoon, the drainage system upstream is not working. Somewhere else is also getting flooded because of where we are located. So it makes sense that we should relocate. Okay. So you have to be able to see that totality, but it does require um, a lot of you know people at the center approach. And I just I just want to invite you all to think of um, this possibility. I think we need to become entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, not consultants. Okay? We really have to put the money where the mouth is. You have to say, okay, boss, I'm going to show you. Come on. We are 10 people. We have a lawyer, an engineer, an environmentalist, a construction, a cost management, Sociologists, people who know how to organize others, etc., etc. We are a team, we are a bunch. And we render this service. And bloody hell, city better pay for my services. I'm doing it for the city. You pay for my services. All right? You pay for our services. We are, you can't do it, municipality can't do it. We, we, we try to do a street improvement project in, in Delhi. So, engineer log sab kya nilage? Sir, jo kaam aap kar rahe ho na, humare to bas ki nahi hai. Hum to kari nahi sakte. Hum ko to aap bata do, itni chawdi sada ke hum bana denge. Bas, khatam. That's all. You know? So, this is a specialized service. And it is, a, you know, it requires organization, skill, capability and so on. So, I think we need bunches of entrepreneurs who render this service in the city. Okay, that is where you are dealing with people who are already living in poor circumstances and are looking for a better life within the city. But, say, 10 years from now, you're looking for a situation where nobody has to come and live in such a situation anymore. Right? That needs a different approach. That needs another institutional framework. Okay, so we can go on. No, I, I can very well relate to what you're saying because in the proposal that you showed, the, the parking issue that we were discussing now, mm. you are saying that, okay, initially, you know, so it's not a one-time solution. No. You are trying to project, let's say, 10 years down the line how this built environment is going to perform. So initially, you are allotting it to, let's say, for the parking spaces, but as mm. the city... The dependency on the car park reduces that same spaces can be freed up for some other purposes, for some other uses. 
So That's I think a similar kind of a transitional approach can perhaps might also be appropriate. One last question. Uh, I would I focus on the housing only. Maybe there's one last question. Uh, it's like you talked about the you actually practically demonstrated how the low rise, the G plus G, what we call walk-in apartments, mm. are far more sustainable in every sense of of the sustainability aspects, whether it is the embodied energy, whether it is freeing up the spaces. Uh, and you were also talking about a density of 400 to 600 units per hectare. Mm. Now, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the current, some of the norms of the GDCR, though, and even I'm sure about some of the other uh, development regulations, they actually practically make it impossible to achieve those kind of densities. You know, even in order to utilize the 1.8 FSI, life becomes difficult. And it's there are many rules actually one can one can discuss here. For example, simple rule like the ground coverage, you know, the mm. uh, 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 is something at times becomes an obstruction in achieving many of the objective that you mm. said. And the demand, because a lot of the GDCR and the norms are written the way I assume from the builder's perspective or just to get things approved and get it done. So don't you think that there is some problem over there that is also uh, that needs yeah. attention for these kind of typologies to take place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. Because, you know, when we when we did this study, we did it in Rajkot. Okay. And we, we drafted or uh, some suggestions for the GDCR, large court. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind this affordable housing requirement, um, and it had to do with parking norms, setback lines, distance between buildings, yes. mixed use, many, many things of this kind, right? Which increased the utilization of land, allowed more density to be produced on the same piece of land without going high rise. Yes. Okay? But this is a technical job. It requires it requires quite a lot of work. I mean, this is something that, you know, universities can, can work hard on and say, Akhavi, let us see. Hey, agar, uh, I mean, high density, low rise examine karna hai, instead of saying, nahi nahi, wo hai. Pahle to wo builder ko aapne, agar usko 2.5 FSI de diya na, uska dimaag vaisi phir jata hai. Wo kahin ka kahin pohunch jata hai. Unnecessarily, you know. He has to consume it. No, no, this is not a story. Let me just tell you. This is fantastic research done by IAM Bangalore. There's a couple of people who researched into what happened. There was a time when there was a lot of homes built close to the city, which are within the range of the middle classes, affordability. And suddenly it stopped. Either you got the loan homes built very far away, or they started becoming very expensive. Right? And then they landed in a situation where the very expensive homes didn't have any buyers. So they said, what's going on? You know, we are just hanging so much cement and steel up in the air with no use. What the hell is going on? So they asked this question. And this is what they found. What they found was that the first time um, the builder went to buy a patch of land, from the agriculturist, he was able to buy it for 10 rupees. Uh, and the FSI was 1.2, all right, or 1.5. Then five years later, when the second time he went to buy the next piece of land, the FI, FSI is not 2.5. And the, the farmer is saying, boss, uh, Price of my land has gone up three times, yeah? What the hell? You make all the money, what about me? Three times more. So he says, okay, now let's see. So if he's going to build something that is saleable, he has to build taller. He has to build more homes. Then he's caught in this thing of how to make it affordable. Taller homes. So certainly out of the affordable range, he's now looking at the upper middle class. And he's now finding that the market for the upper middle class is getting saturated. So, increase in FSI has actually 
raise the price of land in proportion or greater than the proportion of the increase in investment. Right? It hasn't actually served its purpose. The idea was you can build more, therefore the price will come, the, the, the unit price will come down because you thought that the land price was fixed, but it's not. It's, it's a free market. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So it, it went the other way around. So, so here we are, once again, that you do need the planning regulations to be studied technically in terms of how they impact affordability and utilization. Right? Planning may take norm, na? setback. Jitni badi zameen, utna zada setback. Break kyun bhai? But any is a formula. Jitni badi zameen, utna kam covered, ground coverage. Okay. And so on. So they definitely need to be revisited if you're going to perform, uh, promote affordability. Definitely need to be revisited. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shok Lal. You know, we can go on and on and on with interacting with you. It's been two hours already. And, oh, my God. Uh, but we didn't realize. And the presentation, the discussion, everything has been really, really thought provoking. I'm, I'm really thankful to you on behalf of our team here at Archie Diaries that you gave us your valuable time and for the presentation, for the tick questions, everything. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you all very much. And let's stay in touch. Sure. Okay. And uh, Jigna, thank you so much uh, that you gave us your time yeah. and raised some really wonderful questions for the whole discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I really look forward to catching up with you sometime. And uh, please. Jigna, uh, Delhi mein aake kaam karo. Delhi mein aake aap se milenge. Such kya raha? Bahut kaam karna hai So. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much for all the people who have joined with us on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we will continue with these wonderful sessions, uh, except the next Saturday is an exception. We are not having an interview. We'll be having an interview after that. So I hope to see you all of uh, back on, on that Saturday. Thank you so much. Thank you and bye-bye.